I'm joined today by Johnny Campbell. Johnny is the co-founder and CEO of Social Talent, an online learning platform that has been used in 90 countries by more than 1,000 companies and 70,000 recruiters. The path to the success of the business has not always been an easy one. In this interview, we learn what has driven Johnny in his life and career and how his tenacity and resilience, along with the support of his family and his business partner Vince, has enabled them to create a globally renowned company that has shaken up the world of online learning and recruiting. It's a pleasure to introduce Johnny Campbell. Johnny, tell me a little bit about growing up. What was that like? It was fun, like most kids. Um, I grew up in a family of six, four kids. Uh, I was the, or I am the second youngest, older brother, two sisters. I had a happy childhood. Um, we, we had our troubles like everyone else. My dad worked for himself, um, didn't always have work, worked in construction, tarmac. And uh, sometimes there was work and sometimes there wasn't work. And uh, my mother had to go into work when, I guess I was probably about uh, nine or ten. And she'd go get a job and try and bring in the income and she kind of made from then became probably the main breadwinner for a while and I went out to work with her and she used to merchandise in shops. As a 10 year old I went around to help my mum after school and she'd pick us up and um, yeah so I kind of, I loved that, I was, I loved being busy, I was, you know, I had this dream of being a businessman of, uh, you know, when I, was, when, I, when I was younger I always thought I want to have a job with a briefcase and that was, that was it. By 11 I got my first job in my local video store. I used to hang around the video store. We couldn't afford a video player. Nobody could then. And uh, we used to rent one on the odd Friday night. It was an indulgence back in the day. And I used to just go up to the video shop when I was out of school and just hang around and watch the videos they were showing. And eventually the woman who owned the shop took pity on me and said, do you want to help out tomorrow night? And uh, that was, I was 11, that was my first job. And I started helping out three or four days a week um, in the video shop. And I was known, I'm still known from anyone who comes in the area I'm from as the video shop boy. Uh, you'd come in to me at, when I was 14 and you'd ask me what recommendations I have. As a, I've, I, I've seen every film that was released in the 80s and 90s t- umpteen times. Um, but yeah, it was my first job. You're someone now that I think comes across as having a lot of energy. Have you always been like that? My teachers hated me. Um, the odd teacher loved me, but I was disruptive. I'd, I'd try and be the class joker. I'd give lip back to my teachers. Um, I just constantly trying to be talking and buzzing uh, but I've always liked the limelight and that's you gotta have energy if you want to be somebody who likes the limelight and likes to be the center of attention on things like that and I, I, I like that I love the buzz of being a 12 or 13 year old that people would ask for video advice adults in the video shop and that I've always worked with customers in that way like I've always been from 10 I was out with my mom working in shops and you'd be stocking milk and shelf and people would ask you different questions you'd have to talk in the video shop you have to obviously converse all night long, all day long with people, into by, I say by my mid-teens, I had seven uh, jobs, seven employers. I was getting up in my racer and cycling to the local Tesco to stock milk before school. I go to mil- school, leave school, stock bread and crisps in another shop. Um, and all those jobs were, were customer facing, you know, where you have to talk to people. And I think if from a young age you are always being forced to talk to strangers, you kind of have to have that high energy. So what were you like at school in terms of your academic side? Um, I've never struggled uh, with academics. Uh, I guess I, I'm naturally bright in that way in that I can do exams. Um, I can get high grades. I got a scholarship into secondary school. Um, and I wouldn't be, but I'm not academic in the traditional book academia. I don't study. I'm a lousy study. I, I probably would be better now, but I never studied for exams. I just got away with it. I'm mathematically minded, good at English. Um, but when I got to the point where I could actually choose my own subjects, so once you got to, I guess, about 15 years of age, I wanted to do business. And I had three subjects I could pick, and I said, I'll do all business. And I was advised, don't make all business. And I did physics, and I did business studies, commerce, accounting, I think. And at probably by 15, I would realized that the degree to go on to was business studies or commerce and uh, um, so I was always right I gotta save up and I gotta pay if I'm gonna do this I'm gonna pay my own way and I'm gonna go and go to university I'm gonna get the points to go to University College Dublin which is one of say the two leading colleges and I'll do business there but 
I kind of got lost in my day to day in the university, my jobs and everything else, and being so busy with ends and so on and so forth that I kind of didn't tackle that question of what do you want to do when you finish. But I knew that being in university was important to me. Um, but then I got to all of a sudden it was my final year and I was doing my final exams. And I hadn't actually studied. In fact, of the 16 subjects I had that year, I only met, met, I think, five or six of the lecturers. I'd literally never seen the other nine or ten lecturers, never been in their classes, never been in tutorials. I spent a month where I slept every second night and I basically had a, a diet of Red Bull. And uh, through it all, in a haze, because I can't really remember that time because I was so sleep deprived, I got my, my degree. Um, I came out going, right, got to get a job now. I literally had no idea what to do. So I applied to everything, every graduate job. I applied to jobs in the UK with breweries on graduate schemes. I applied to insurance companies, sales companies. I was still working nights in the nightclub. Meantime, I'd been interviewing, uh, going into different companies. I'd been working till four in the morning one night uh, in the nightclub. And uh, the next morning I had an interview with an agency at like nine o'clock. I rocked up to this interview and um, the two women from the agency sit me down. And normally what happens is, I'm at a desk of someone in an agency and they're going, so what jobs will you do? What skills do you have? Writing notes and then just sending me out. And they sat me down and started presenting to me on who they are, what recruitment's all about, what their vision is, how they're growing, what the team is, and why they're looking for someone new in the accounting and finance team to recruit accountants. And they stopped after 10 minutes and said, so tell me why you want to be a recruiter. And they're going, oh crap, uh, I didn't research this. I got it all wrong. I said, let's go for it. I went, well, actually, um, Sarah, my best friend is a recruiter and he's told me all about it. Those things you just said, yeah, he told me that too. I bluffed it. Four interviews later, I had a job offer, which I accepted. And I spent three and a half years with that agency and I've worked in recruitment ever since. So your early career, you started off in recruitment, you stepped out of recruitment, you went back into recruitment, and then you spent some time when you moved to the Cayman Islands. Just tell me about that phase of your life. So I left recruitment after three and a half years, 24 years of age, thinking I knew everything. Did hardware sales for a year, and that taught me a lot about just a different perspective on sales and taught me that I also wasn't done recruiting. That I had a lot more to learn. Got a job in a recruitment agency through a friend of mine. His friend had set up a, a small agency doing accounting recruiting, and that was a business called Accurate. I got back into uh, recruiting then, spent three years with them, and was very happy. But one day, in the middle of that, I got a phone call um, from a headhunter. In fact, actually, I got two phone calls in one day. One from a headhunter in the UK asking me about a job, and the other a headhunter, well, it was a lady who worked in an agency in Cayman, the Cayman Islands, saying that her boss, the owner, wanted to hire a deputy MD, and would I consider? And I kind of laughed and said, thank you, flattered, but I have just bought a house, and I'm engaged to be married, I have two dogs, and uh, you know, that's not for me. And I went home that night and I said it, said it to Jill, in passing over dinner, um, my fiance, I got these two head home calls, I'm quite proud of myself. And on the Cayman one she said, uh, so why'd you say no? And I was like, well, because like, we have a house and we have dogs and you know, we're getting married next year. And she said, well, we can come back and do the wedding here, uh, we can bring the dogs with us and rent the house. So why'd you say no? I was kind of stuck. Uh, well, do you want me to read the back? And she said, yes. And then we said, well, where's the Cayman Islands? I have no idea. So we got a map, it's pre-Google Maps days. And we looked and said, oh, there it is, kind of below America. Ooh, interesting. And we rented the firm out with Tom Cruise because that's the only reference I had was, that's in the Cayman Islands. And I saw a snapshot of a beach at night. And that's all I got. So I called them the next day. And long story short, uh, four months later, I, was, I arrived in the Cayman Islands on my own, off a flight. Um, my wife and two dogs were to follow on a month later. And I arrived in Cayman um, to join this company I'd never heard of uh, on an island I hadn't previously known uh, to run the recruitment agency. So what was that like? So Cayman was life changing for me. Um, uh, Cayman and, and my wife now, Jill, uh, I had at, the point, at that point, Nick, you know, very focused on the briefcase. And by the way, I had a briefcase in my first recruitment job. Um, you'd look foolish bringing a briefcase to a meeting these days, but I used to love it. But I was in business and I wanted to be a millionaire. But when you live in a Caribbean island with endless sunshine um, and you hang around with great people and you get married and you find the right person, you change. And I softened for the right reasons. And I kind of learned that 
there's more to life. But our life in Cayman was amazing. My wife had got a, a job at the local school. She's a special needs teacher and she was, had a perfect job there. Um, our dogs had settled in, we lived on the beach. Had this amazing lifestyle and you can imagine every holiday you've ever had, that's every weekend and every night. You talked about how the Cayman Islands changed you. Why did you want to become a millionaire? To me it was a measure of success of effort. That millionaires are the people who work the hardest and come out on top. And a big fan of you know entrepreneurs I'd heard about when I was growing up, like Richard Branson. Kind of going, that's amazing, look what they've done. Um, and my dad's business hadn't been the success he wanted it to be for tons of reasons. And I wanted to have a successful business. And I actually wanted to create jobs. Um, yeah, I wanted to be a millionaire, but I wanted to create jobs. Um, I had this thing about, you know, creating enough money and wealth that I could set up a homeless shelter in Ireland, in Dublin, and anyone who needed um, help could come in and you could give back and I'd create jobs for other people and good jobs. So it wasn't all about material items or having money for the no, material purposes? Uh, no, material purposes were a big part of it, don't get me wrong at the start, but when you, the lifestyle in Cayman, I, had, I wanted for nothing. I shifted my priorities and realized that, yes, I don't want to be poor. I don't want to have no money. I want to run a business and have impact on lots of people's lives by employing them, by doing things that helps them. And working in recruiting, when you're in a long time, I'm sure you get this, Nick, as well. You could be at a sales job, and I could sell computers, right? When I was sold computers for a year, nobody, nobody's life was changed because they bought our brand of computer, right? It was just a computer. But in recruiting, and I, I kind of always use the example of the butcher. We, uh, we hired, actually, um, a butcher we hired when we set up our first agency after Cayman to go back to Cayman. And I called a guy I found online, randomly his name that he was a butcher in some butcher in the south of England. And I call, got his phone number, rung him up and said, do you want to work in the Cayman Islands? And like me previous to that, he had no idea where the Cayman Islands was. And through all the conversations, he relocated with his wife. He still lives there today and has a family. He lives in the Caribbean Islands. I imagine his family and friends go, how did our mate the butcher end up working in the Cayman Islands? And he doesn't remember me or Vince or the fact that we rung him. I know that. But we changed people's lives because we, we connected them with opportunities. And I must have hired hundreds of temps that came to work in the Cayman Islands. I'm connected to most of them still on Facebook, people I would have hired over the years. And actually, you forget that we had that relationship, that I would have helped them get a job. But I look and go, they married people they met there. They have kids because they moved to the Cayman Islands. And the impact you can have in recruitment is amazing. You've got this great life in the Cayman Islands. Did you see that was your future? So no. Um, funny stuff, I was meant to come back and set up a business with my old boss. He was on an earn out from the company he'd sold that I'd resigned from. And after about a year and a half, I was due to come back and we were going to set up a new recruitment agency together. And that was all set to happen January 2008. And a week before Christmas, the December 27, uh, 2007, um, he gave me a call and said, listen, the partnership, which was going to be 60-40 in his favour, he was changing it. He was inviting another old colleague of ours to join. And anyway, I was sitting in my board shorts and Javianas and a t-shirt in the sun outside Kirk Supermarket in Grand Cayman, sitting on the ground with my phone. And I said, well, I'm not going into business anymore. I said, what? And he wasn't expecting me to go nuclear on this. My flights were booked. I had given notice on my house um, in the Cayman Islands. My wife was going to move in with friends of ours so she could finish the school term up until June. We told our tenants back in Ireland that they had to leave our house. They'd vacated it. And I just cancelled all those plans. I came home and told Jill, I'm, I'm not moving home anymore. Why did you want to go back to Ireland? Did you not want to stay on the Cayman Islands with this great life you were having? It's funny. Um, I stayed that Christmas and I had a BA flight booked that I never used to go home. We found a new apartment, a place to stay. A couple of friends of ours came over to visit us at Christmas and uh, um, I wasn't meant to be there. I was meant to be home in Ireland on my own in a cold January and I wasn't. Accidentally I was stayed in Cayman and we got pregnant um, that January, February, uh, which shouldn't have happened. And uh, that kind of changed very much my wife Jill's perspective on things. She loved the lifestyle as well, but she was like, I don't want to raise a kid here with no family, no friends, or two flights away from Ireland. Um, just feels a bit too far. And we were the, you know, our friends and came and none of them had kids, so we were the first. So um, we moved home. And uh, we were due our first child in September, so we moved home in, in July, but I didn't have a plan. And my plan was changed. I was like, I'm like, going to set my own agency up then. I didn't like the idea of doing that. It sounded lonely. 
because I'd like the idea of a partnership with somebody else. Do you, are you somebody that thrives off having other people around you? I need various muses and people. Um, other people bring out the best in me. Uh, I'm probably not as good on my own. And I was looking for a partner and I had remembered a, this guy who um, uh, I knew from came and Vince who'd been in sales, head of sales for Digicel. And coincidentally, we just announced we were pregnant to our friends. And my buddy said, do you hear Vince is coming back to the island? I was like, really? I thought he didn't want to come back to here, come back here. And he goes, well, he's been put, made a big offer, like a huge package. He's going to be coming back to Digicel. Don't tell anyone. I said, all right. And I rung him. I said, Harry, I see. I heard you're coming back. He goes, yeah, he got the money. He can't really turn it down. He goes, hmm. I said, would you go into business with me? He said, do what? And I said, I'm going to start a recruitment agency. He goes, oh, what was that like? I said, oh, you'll, you'll make millions. And he goes, really? I said, I'll send you a spreadsheet. And I, in my head, this all made sense. Um, he goes, yeah, I hate my job. Let's do it. So I moved home in July. We moved back into our house. We were two or three months out from having our first child. Uh, Vince quit his job and we set up Select People, which is our first recruitment agency. And we said we'd, um, we'd recruit people to work in the Caribbean and overseas because I still have my clients and connections and they, I felt they would still work with me. But by September, the world had collapsed. Um, recession. This was 2008? 2008, yeah. Uh, I hadn't, you know, what did we say I saw it coming? I didn't see it coming. Um, and we set up this business. We put, I think, five or 10 grand in each that we'd saved to set up an agency. I was working out of my house. And by September, I had to work out of a porter cabin in my back garden. I had a two bedroom house. We needed the second bedroom for the new child. I had no money to rent an office space. We already kind of knew the world was ending, to, uh, you know, economy wise. Um, and so I rented a porter cabin that was lifted over my back garden wall and, and that was my first office. And Vince was working out of an office. He worked out of a, a, a literally a dilapidated old farmhouse that he had a 20 meter flex running from his barn house um, to power it and he a heater on one side, one fingerless glove to keep this side warm whilst the heater kept that side warm and then during the day he'd swap the heater over and have a fingerless glove. And um, we worked together by turning on Skype at nine in the morning, me from my porter cabin, him from his old house and we'd leave it on for 10 hours in the background as we worked and tried to fill jobs. But the jobs weren't there to be filled. Um, or more precisely, we had jobs to fill, but nobody was interested in paying an agency fee because there was a recession on. People were cutting back. And the model of having a database or advertising on job boards wasn't going to cut, it wasn't going to get as a fee. And so within a couple of months, we were facing a crisis. We were running out of money. We both had small children, a new baby, no money. We were not even paying ourselves. All the money we invested was gone. And we had to figure out a way to survive. So let's talk about that period then from set up as a recruitment agency, the market had collapsed. You had a few clients, but it was quite tough, wasn't it? So we had to find a way to deliver a service that was worth paying for in a recession. And so if you're in a recession, what are the only jobs you'll pay an agency for? They're really hard jobs. So we said, right, we stopped working the jobs that people were giving us because they felt sorry for us or they knew us. And we started saying, what's your hardest job? Is there one job you just can't fill? It's been open for ages. Can we have that, please? And one of the first customers that came back to us was uh, an insurance company in Cayman who had this open role they couldn't fill for a long time. And the subsidiary we placed for, I didn't know there was a subsidiary of a bigger company, and the COO of their biggest company, their parent company, called us and said, can you do more work for us, for our other sister companies? Uh, there was a guy called Ted Petrera, and Ted's a, Ted still amazes me. Ted changed us. He was that one customer who brought us in a new direction. All of a sudden, we were specialists in insurance. Was that a pivotal moment? A uh, pivotal moment. Um, you know what? There's, it's funny. We've had loads of pivotal moments. We are always just about to go broke, just about to close, just about to run out of money when something happens. And you look back at, there's been so many moments that have been pivotal. You kind of go, well, are they really accidents, or do we just create the opportunity for that? And I think we create the opportunity um, because we, we t recently took on a new chairman in our business and, and he said that we're the best listeners he's ever met. And the one thing myself and Vince do well, I think, is that we never assume that we've got the best answer. We will ask everybody else and listen for openings or opportunities. And we hear something good, we'll jump on it and try it out. It may not work, but we'll try it out. We, are, we know we don't have all the answers. We don't have that cockiness to go, we have all the answers. We do have the balls to ask everybody else what they're doing and we're not afraid to steal or borrow from the best. 
And I guess that's what we did. We said, here's an opening. We can make money in insurance. Let's go for it. Let's go after this client and give them loads of love. And we, we kind of found ourselves in a new niche. We started hiring some staff. And we, had a, we discovered what we now call social recruiting or sourcing. And we found a way to use, leverage LinkedIn. And if you recall that 2008, social media was only beginning to break out back then. I remember that I used to set up Facebook pages and for loads of things. And I get excited when we'd get 100 fans and Vince would go, it's brilliant, Johnny, how many placements did we make? And it kept us focused on how do we leverage digital, not for the sake of it, but to has to make money. It has to make money quickly because we'll literally run out of cash. Um, we said, well, we could grow a business around this. This is amazing. Keep hiring loads of people. But we also realized that what we did wasn't proprietary. Anybody could do this. And we also reckoned everybody would start doing it pretty soon. So we decided to hedge our bets. And we said, let's set up, a, set up a company that does it for other companies and keep our agency. And let's give it a year or two and see which one is most successful after that period of time. So Vince stayed running the agency. I separated myself from the agency and stopped working jobs and started working on what we called social talent. Actually, what we called Social Business Process Outsourcing Limited. That was our first name. We had a, we'd done a bit of consultancy and we had to invoice them and we needed to have a company name to, to send the invoice and we had no money so we had to think of something. So we were Social BPO Limited actually for the first year with trading name Social Talent which came two months later and now we're Social Talent. But we, we set up this business consulting around social recruiting and in that year we learned that doing people's social recruiting for them wasn't the idea. Teaching them was the idea. So you effectively split in the risk got the traditional business still going whilst you experiment in effect with the social talent side. So just explain what happened next. After a year, we built up a client base who had, a, we had retainers, monthly retainers of a couple of grand to run their social media. Now we tried to go after recruitment companies and we had a couple of them, but we also did a pub, we did a telecoms company. Uh, we did anything we could get to get money. Very laborious and we had to do this, I, you know, I needed to have people to help me. So, so we hired our two, first two interns, two great people who came to work with us for nothing. One a blogger and one someone in video. And we'd make videos for, we made a video for a meatpacking company on how to use their machines. We made a video for a, a car dealership on why they're a great car dealership. Um, just because we could get money coming in. And, but we quickly changed the model to training people to source and to recruit was actually more interesting than running their Facebook pages. And that led us into kind of teaching people how to be more effective at internet sourcing and recruiting. Um, we gave it a name, we called it initially the Blue Belt in Internet Recruitment. We figured don't call it the Black Belt yet because you're not finished. And um, we started doing classroom training in agencies and in companies in the UK and Ireland and that became our business. In those early days selling this service and product, did people understand what it was. Nobody knew they needed what we offered them. We knew that we could teach them a way of recruiting that was much more efficient, much more productive. Um, they just didn't know that yet. So we had to get this, um, I guess what's called now thought leadership, by going, did you know that you can do this? And people go, I didn't know we could do that. What else could we do? You could do this. And then they go, what else? And I go, well, we have a course and we can train your guys. But I was so busy delivering it, we had no time to sell it. And that's when we made the decision that Vince needed to come on board in this business. And the agency hadn't really grown that much. It was still wetting its face. It paid my wages for the first six months of social talent, but it wasn't growing. And we could fix that or we could grow social talent. We couldn't do both. Um, and, when, no uh, and when you say it paid your wages, what we're talking about is sustenance, really. Aren't sustenance. You? Yeah. Uh, like it was, uh, back in the day, myself and we, our first child, myself and Jill, would literally go and find the cheapest bread we could buy. We'd make decisions on, you know, it was an extravagance to have a, a bottle of wine. We became brilliant at finding the best cheap Tesco wine. But we were broke when everyone was broke, which made it so much easier um, because everyone around you doesn't have money. But also it helps you be lean. And we've never been funded in social talent. Where it's a, I don't know if it's a good or bad decision. We've never had funding. Um, we've grown organically. And when it's your own money and you don't have much of it, you make smart decisions. Um, you make wrong decisions all the time, but you've got to make them quickly and you'll learn from them. So you don't overspend on stuff. You ask yourself, do we really need that? Um, and, and we always have had this lean approach, which is you don't spend money you don't need to spend. When it's worth it, spend it. But spend it, make sure it's back to Vince's quote, 
Johnny, did we get any placements from that Facebook page? It's always whatever we spent money on, we've got to quickly realize a return. If we're not getting it, kill it and move on. How important is it to have the right business partner? Um, having a really good business partner is unbelievably important. I nearly had the wrong business partner. And now I have the best business partner in the world who brings out the best in me, and I hope I do with him. We're different. Myself and Vince have very different traits, very different qualities. We've enough the same to make us work brilliantly as a team, but we bring completely different things to the table. When I was up, he was down, and when I occasionally get down, he'd bring me up. And Vince is more of a, he always describes me as being the front man. I love the limelight. And he's no interest in that. He likes being in the background and doing the stuff. And, you know, we've worked together now for nearly 10 years. And it's probably the best business decision I ever made in my life was to go into business with Vince. And we could probably be in any sort of business. What's most important is we have the partnership to help ourselves get through the tough times and make good decisions together. So we've got to the point where you've, you're throwing everything into social talent effectively. What happened next? We had figured out that scaling the business by being by hiring 20 trainers wasn't going to work. So we thought, let's, let's, let's put it online. And we started filming all our knowledge, all our training courses, our first eight hours of filming um, on the platform and hosted it and structured it and said, well, well, how do we sell this? And accidentally, just as it was ready to go live, I got a phone call from a friend of mine who worked in Oracle. And uh, she called and said, listen, you've got good ideas about recruiting and social. Our heads of recruitment from the different global geos are in Ireland uh, today, and I'd love if you could come meet them. So, you know, I met these heads and they said, so, you, you know, show your presentation. I said, well, no, no, I wasn't, I don't have a presentation. I was just here, come here to have a chat. So, okay, I said, well, these are our challenges. We're trying to use this world of LinkedIn and sourcing and social. How does it all work? And I said, actually, funnily, we just, we're going to launch a platform next month that has all this online. And I opened up my browser, put it on the screen and showed them. And a month later, they became our first customer. Had you given a lot of thought to how that would be sold? We knew what people would pay for a person to come training for a day. And we kind of made up a price. Um, uh, we charged, I think, 195 euros per license the first day, first um, iteration. And we're uh, approaching 10 times that now. Um, we had it mispriced. And actually, it's funny. You want to try and impact as many people as possible. I wanted a million recruiters in the world to learn this overnight. And I figured the only way to do that is make it free. But if we had have made it free for a million recruiters, nobody would have paid attention. When it became premium, when it became a quality product that only people who were serious about investing in um, would buy or could buy, they took it seriously. They made sure their teams took it seriously. They implemented it. And I've learned you need to bring a high quality pedigree product to the market that is charged at a premium price before anyone takes it seriously. You've just got to this point where you've established in the platform, got your first big client with Oracle. Is that the point really where it start, started to take off? It started to become more serious then. And I guess we, we, <clears throat> we pushed hard to grow. We, we never wanted to be this tiny business. But back then even, we struggled to pay the bills. Um, myself and Vince would have regularly got into overdraft territory. Um, I know we had our max overdraft back then was 20 grand, and we'd regularly get to 19,950 negative on payday. And we put our, you know, the wages we had for the three or four people working for us at the time would go on my credit card or Vince's credit card. We'd skip payment for the month. Um, and it was tight, and we had to hide that from the team. Uh, although we were as open as we could be, we don't want them distressed. It's tough, it's lean. And you then you get cash in, you go, well, just slow down and we'll be okay. I didn't let it. Um, Vince would pull, try and pull me to a more sensible position. I go, but we're not done, we've so much more to go. And we go and hire another person, just as we're getting slightly comfortable again, or we'd spend money on another camera, or we'd go on a trip somewhere, or whatever it might be, hire another developer. And it's, it's hard because you've got to balance this. Uh, you've got to grow without growing for broke. Uh, it's so easy to grow, grow for broke. Um, and we doubled and doubled and doubled and doubled and doubled. And doing that with no investment is tough. It's strain on the business. Were you ever tempted by that to get investment? Uh, yeah, we've talked to several, a couple of our customers um, did due diligence with us to try and invest into us. We got to a very close stage at one. And 
we realized towards the end that they were probably going to really more buy us and assume us than let us continue to live our vision. And uh, it all came down to, we were talking to one of their staff about um, their browser. It sounds like a silly story, but they couldn't install a Chrome extension. And they were talking about they had to get IT appro to approve it. It would take three months. We said, are we seriously going to work for a company to take IT to approve us having a Chrome extension on our laptops by next month? No. And we kind of said, that's just, it's not us. That We liked doing our own thing. We liked being different. Talk through the last few years and where social talent is at now. We've got about 60 odd people now um, at time of filming. We, gosh, we, uh, we sell in, 100 countries maybe. Um, we've got users all over the world, platform in three languages at the moment and adding more all the time. Our own development team, um, we're a sales machine, marketing machine, content production machine. When did you start to see the acceleration in, in, in the growth? So really it was, so we're 2017 now, end of 2015, it really kicked into gear. And that's when we started getting serious and then started hiring more salespeople and more marketing people. Last year we'd exploded in terms of hiring people. We doubled um, like 30 odd people at the start of the year to closing over 60. It wasn't the right way to do it though. And, and what happens is when you're scaling like that, it isn't a linear trajectory of, we just keep doubling staff and doubling growth and everyone's happy. You double staff, some of the staff were wrong. You hire them for the wrong jobs. Your product's wrong. The way you market no longer works. The, your product suits, the product you built is not the one that suits the customers you now have and things break. And they break about every six to nine months, I've learned. And they break hard. Um, they break in such a way that you could go under and you could you know, disappear overnight. And you don't have the cash in the bank to survive big problems like that. So even though you grow and scale, you create new problems. Your payroll isn't, it's now of a size you can never put on a credit card. Um, so you have to have that, you have to look after those people. And we, we, we had a big wobble midway through last year. Um, no one outside the business would see, see the wobble, but we did internal wobble. Wobble with our culture, we did wobble with the way we sell, we did wobble with our product. Um, and we've come out of that learning what we're really good at. I remember a phrase that I learned from one of my lecturers in commerce when I was 19 about, about innovation. And I was about stick to the knitting. I think it's a principle that was down somewhere. And have you ever heard that, stick to the knitting? It's about doing what you do best. And we've had to figure out what we do best and realize what it is we do and what it is we don't. When you're, when you're starting off, you're building your own business, you take money from anybody. You say yes to everything. But you create a company and a product that mightn't be actually brilliant. You don't stick to the knitting. You just take what's available. And it's really great when you're growing to have that attitude, to be flexible, to be open. But once you have responsibility for a staff, a team, a business, a product, users, customers, you have to take more responsibility for what it is you do and do that really, really well. How different is your job now to what it was three or four years ago? It's very different. Um, my job three or, three or four years ago was I wrote all the content. I was very heavily involved in designing the product. Uh, intricately involved in the marketing, the blogs, where we're going, uh, how we sell, meeting customers, driving new leads. One of the things that myself and Vince have learned, um, we struggle with this, um, we'll probably always struggle with this, is you've got to learn to give away your Legos. That's an expression we stole from an article that was sent around the company last year. How do you learn to give away your Legos? As a founder, you do everything. And you begin to hire people who support you. Then you begin to hire people who run those departments. And I learned from some of the people I worked for over the year, years that you can only get to a certain size if you don't let go. I mean, totally let go. Which is a realization that today, you're the best person to do this. And probably for the next six, next six to 12 months, you can do it better than everybody else, even the people you've hired. But that's not scalable. And you will never scale unless you give autonomy to other people to do it. And you've got to walk away and stop, but, stop putting your nose in. And you've got to accept the fact that the quality isn't what it would be had you done it yourself. But you know in a year's time, it's going to maybe meet your quality. And in a year and a half, it's going to ex exceed anything you could have ever done. Just looking back then over your career, what are the key lessons that you've learned? I started my career interviewing people who knew more about their subject than I could ever know, accountants. And I had to figure out what they knew. I had to 
come up with great ways of asking questions. Best thing I've learned is to ask questions. I have asked questions of everyone I meet who runs a business involved in technology, purchases stuff, has a recruitment team, has a sales team, and then try and think about how you can use that. So one is to ask questions, to be open-minded, and to have a really wide source of influence, um, way outside just your, your industry. Second is to, to experiment, take risks. I love taking risks, um, but the calculated risks. I know how much risk I'm willing to take, as in I know, where, I know where the cliff edge is, and I'll run as fast as I can, as close as I can to that cliff edge without falling off. But falling short of that's not good enough. You need to take calculated risks and don't get comfortable. Um, break things, um, challenge things. That's really important. Um, but also give back. You know, um, we now get asked by other companies who are much smaller than us, who are us four years ago for advice. And I will cancel meetings to go meet those people because I still do it for companies who are ahead of us. And I'll keep doing it. Um, give away your best knowledge. It's free. It is, ideas are free. Ideas are easy. Execution is really difficult. And I told the world when we first started out Social Talent how I felt they should recruit. And I gave it away for free and loads of people didn't, didn't listen, didn't read it, didn't implement it. Only when we developed a solution that we could work with them did we help them actually implement it. The ideas are always free. Your innovation, your new thing, I'm gonna be the whatever of whatever. Someone else has already thought of that, trust me, but executing on that is really hard. And only a small handful of people that can execute and follow through, take the risks, have the grit to survive, um, have the, you could call it the confidence, foolishness or whatever, to follow through and, and take those risks. Um, but it's kind of going that, you know, you don't have to have the ideas. Um, and your ideas aren't that precious or, or unique either. But your ability to follow through and even if you need to change course, if the idea you start with isn't the idea that ends up working, the pivoting, your tenacity to follow through with that, to keep asking for advice, to ask for help, to take help, to follow through, that's gonna make you successful. When people think about starting a business and you, you've shown that you have to throw your heart and soul into it, you have to keep going when it's tough, how do you balance that with the rest of your life? The 28 year old me would have worked 80, 90, 100 hours a week endlessly and maybe would have had a business much bigger than ours is today. Um, the post came in me, realizes that you've got to see your bigger picture, your why. Just like you look to your customers, why? Well, why do I want the big business? Why do I want to be successful? What do I get out of it? Not monetarily, what do I get out of it satisfaction wise? What do I get out of life? And work is a subset of life. It isn't an alternative to life. Life, it shouldn't be balanced against life. It's work-life balance is crazy. You have work and it's part of a much bigger thing called life. That's much more important. Um, although your work is obviously part of that life. I go home um, when I'm in Ireland, and I travel a lot, but when I'm in Ireland, I'm at home sitting at the dinner table at six o'clock. I have three kids, um, Aaron who's uh, eight, the twin boys, Jake and Archie who are two. They're a handful. My wife's amazing. Um, I wanna get home and spend time with her and the kids. I don't work weekends. I don't open my laptop in the evenings. I might check the odd email. Um, but I try not to, and Vince is the same. And I don't know how much more successful or less successful we, we would be with a different attitude, but we kind of go, you know, do everything you can. Work smarter in the hours you put into your job. You should not celebrate people who work 70 or 80 hours a week. You should, you should say, okay, when are you stopping? That's okay in the interim. What's your plan to stop and get back to 40 hours by next month? Because you're foolish to work 80 hours a week. It's crazy, we all are. You get unhappy. I don't like people in our company working crazy hours. We try and say, go home. And what's important to you now? Important to me are bringing my three boys into the world. Um, what world will they come into? Um, how will they be set for success? What's their way of, well, how they grow up? Will they have manners? Will they be polite? I love meeting different people. I love, I get to travel a lot. I travel about every week around the world. I've seen amazing countries. I meet brilliant people. Um, I still like spending every night in my own bed, my own family, putting the kids to bed, reading a story. Um, I like my time to go running um, and my time out to go for a run and keep healthy. Um, I spend time with my wife doing stuff. Uh, when I'm not working, 
I spend it with friends. Uh, myself and Jill are terrible for just spending time together. We'd rather go for a meal with a bunch of friends than just go out together. Because um, we love to chat and hear what else is going on in other people's lives and do that stuff. So my perfect life is always being challenged at work in something that I can see real impact in. But being able to do everything I can for my kids and have a wonderful life with my wife and my friends. And what's your greatest achievement? Right, its achievement is bringing three boys into the world. Um, we had, uh, and hopefully any other kids we bring into the world. And uh, our first came as an accident. It shouldn't have been. Our first kid, I was meant to be in Ireland, not seeing my wife for six months. And by an accident of a phone call made outside a Kirk's supermarket in Cayman one night, my first kid was born. And our next two kids didn't come easily. We went through years of not being able to have kids. Turned out that we probably shouldn't have been able to have our first kid. And um, when, when Jake and Archie were born, it was after years of hard work and tribulation that myself and my wife went through, uh, whilst I was trying to buy, grow a business and not go broke in the middle of it. And that was really, really tough. So I see, the, I see you know, the look, how lucky I am to have three wonderful kids and to be able to have the opportunity to influence what they do in the world. And I now have three boys that I can help make an impact three times what I can. And they can hopefully, through their kids or nieces or nephews that they influence in their lives, have that exponential impact in what they do. And finally, what does the future hold for you now? My wife jokes about, oh, I'll sell the company and we could, you know, we could retire and you could do all these things together. I'd go nuts if I wasn't working and doing my thing. And we now have a comfortable enough life, myself and Vince, using an analogy. We have this analogy from years ago of pots and pans. So we say that when you get, if you get successful and you sold your company or you grow and you pay yourselves more, what do you do with that money? When you buy fancier pots and pans, so your pots and pans are more expensive than you used to have. And then you buy more expensive stuff, but you don't really have the same value. I'm fine with what I have right now. It'll do me absolutely fine. I don't spend much money on anything. Um, what I'd like to do is travel, do stuff with my kids, my family, bring them on trips, do stuff with the boys. We love doing stuff together as a family, getting out. I kind of drive my, my wife nuts at weekends because I don't like to sit in and sit still and relax, as she says. I like to get out and do things. So hopefully the future has more fun, more trips, more dinners with friends, more nights out, more people over in our house for, for, for dinner and chats and more opportunities to do really cool things with social talent. Johnny, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thanks, Nick. Thank you very much. You have to kind of have that courage, have that belief, have that confidence that you can do it. In my very last week of high school, I was involved in a serious car accident and that really changed the trajectory of my career. It frustrates me when I see people wasting their talent. You really have to be a business leader before you can be a, a HR partner. I have the formula for success at work and I, I don't have the formula for success in every other area of my life. You never know where what you're doing today is going to lead you to tomorrow. You know, we lost her so early but yet she did all those things, she proved them wrong. So she was a phenomenal, phenomenal person. You know, I just thought I'm just going to push through. It's when it really hit home how far away you are, you can't just jump on a plane and be there tomorrow. You want to be that person that creates something phenomenal in this world no matter where you've come from or what you've been through. That's, that's who you want to be.